Welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Rosanna. And I'm Nikki. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where Rosanna has just six rounds to figure out how the first article could possibly be connected to the last, while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. So far this month, we've gone from Greek fire to the Library of Alexandria. Round one. Today we're spiraling from the Library of Alexandria to Great White Shark. The Library of Alexandria was one of the largest and most significant libraries of the ancient world that was completely destroyed. A Great White Shark is a species of shark that can be found in the waters of all major oceans. It's really big, and it has a lot of teeth. (laughs) Like most sharks. (laughs) Rosanna, do you see anything that these two items have in common? I sure don't. I mean, seriously, these are way far off from each other. I'll tell you one thing. Okay. They both existed at the same time. Yeah, I think I knew that. I think that's the extent of my knowledge. (laughs) (laughs) Let me tell you more about the Library of Alexandria. Okay. It was constructed in the 3rd century BC and remained until 30 BC. It was built very similarly to a modern university with lecture halls, meeting rooms, lots of big collections. It was created by uh, Ptolemy I Soter. He was a Macedonian general and the successor of Alexander the Great, whom you've probably heard of. I have. And the library was part of a larger research institution called the Museum of Alexandria. And that's where most of the famous thinkers of the ancient world studied. In addition to the library, the museum had rooms for study of astronomy, anatomy, and even a zoo with exotic animals. And they didn't just collect works from the past. The library was also home to a ton of different international scholars. The Ptolemaic dynasty also patronized this museum. And they provided travel, lodging, and stipends for entire families. Wow. Of people that came to study there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. Interesting fact about the Library of Alexandria. There is a story that actually seems pretty true, considering how much material they had, that every ship that visited the city had to surrender all the books they had on board for immediate copying. The (gasps) owners then got a copy And the pharaohs kept the original in the library. Wow. If you were in a hurry, you didn't get your copy if you didn't (gasps) stay long enough for it to be copied. No. Because it took a long time because they wrote everything by hand. Right. But still. So maybe don't take any books when you're going to Alexandria in ancient times. Round two. Rosanna, what do you think the next degree is between Library of Alexandria and Great White Shark? Well, you did mention something that seems like it would definitely have a connection. Okay. You said that the library, which was kind of like a university, had a zoo of exotic animals. The great white shark is an animal. That is a true statement. It is. It is true. But it seems (laughs) like maybe we're too far away from that degree to actually go with something like that. (laughs) Unless all the rest of the degrees are just more animals. Like, maybe you're going to start at a really small animal and just get bigger and bigger till you land on shark. That could be an idea. You know me so well, <laughs> Based on that wild discussion, I'm going to go with Ptolemaic Dynasty. All right. Your guess of the Ptolemaic Dynasty is... Incorrect. Is it zoo? Your guess of zoo is also incorrect. Okay. The next degree is Alexander the Great. Ah, of course it was, because that was probably even getting me my third guess. Alexander the Great was Alexander III of Macedon. He lived from 356 BC to 323 BC. He was 32 when he died. Oh, I did not know that. Alexander the Great, yes. Very young, but highly accomplished. (laughs) How? <laughs> I'm going to tell you. So he succeeded his father, Philip II, to the throne 
of Macedonia, at the age of 20, and even though he only lived 32 years and didn't start ruling until he was 20, so he had 12 years of ruling. Yeah. He was the king of Macedonia, a pharaoh of Egypt, the king of Persia, and lord of Asia by the time he died. I'm sorry. Lord of Asia? That is not a thing. It sounds really fake. <laughs> but he was. He founded 20 cities that bore his name, most notably Alexandria in Egypt. I recommend people go read this article or re-skim it. I don't include all of his battles, but he was undefeated in battle. Wow. When he died. He was an amazing military commander. He spent most of his ruling years on a completely unprecedented military campaign going through Asia and Northeast Africa. He created one of the largest empires of the ancient world by the time he was 30. They went from the Adriatic Sea to the Indus River, Greece, to northwestern India, for the geographically challenged, like me. He is considered one of history's most successful military commanders. Well, yeah. Based on what I read in this article, I would love to see a movie of his life, like a, a dramatized version. But there was one story where he wanted to cross a mountain, and he got it to a pass, and there was an army there. And he got to the next pass. There was an army there, too. So overnight, he took his army, which was like 3,000 cavalry, around the third mountain pass, came up behind them, and then they woke up to Alexander's army just surrounding them. Ugh. And so they surrendered, and he got a bigger army because they all joined his army. He died in Babylon in 323 BC. He fell sick and died 12 days later. He was sick the whole time. Hmm. It's possible that he was poisoned. They really don't know. Oh. They were like, look what this guy's done in 12 years. We can't let him live any longer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he planned to make Babylon his capital, but died before he could. But he had all these planned campaigns that would have begun with an invasion of Arabia, which he probably would have taken over Arabia as well. Sure. What would have stopped him at that point? But after he died, there was a civil war, actually several civil wars that completely tore his empire apart. Wow. He didn't have a solid heir. He had a child that was born after he died. So that legitimacy could be in question. But even then, they would have been a baby. So right. the yeah. generals, you know, had, there was a lot of fighting. Interesting fact about Alexander the Great. During his youth, he was tutored by none other than Aristotle. Wow. He also probably had heterochromia iridum, which is one dark eye, one light eye. Oh. David Bowie style. Round three. Rosanna, what's the next degree between Alexander the Great and Great White Shark? Um, I don't know much about sharks' eyes, but <laughs> I think I'm going to go with heterochromia iridum anyway. Your guess of heterochromia iridum is incorrect. But, interesting point, great white sharks don't have black eyes like other sharks. They have dark blue eyes. That is interesting. But how do you know none of them don't have heterochromia iridum and have a black eye and a blue eye? Hmm? That's a double negative. None of them don't have... <laughs> That's true. I can't prove it. The next degree is Adriatic Sea. Oh, no. That was nowhere on my list. The Adriatic Sea is a body of water that separates the Italian peninsula from the Balkan peninsula. It's the northern arm of the Mediterranean. So basically, to the right of Italy. Countries that have coasts on the Adriatic are Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, which I've never heard of. Yeah. Croatia, Italy, Montenegro, and Slovenia. It sounds like a lovely place to swim. Their surface water temperatures, while they're about 54 degrees Fahrenheit in winter, they get up to 86 degrees Fahrenheit in summer. Wow. Yeah. That sounds nice. Yeah. Especially to us Oregonians, where even in like the height of summer... It's the cold. sea is maybe 50 degrees. It is a cold ocean. If you're lucky. <laughs> it's very cold. There are dozens of marine protected areas in the Adriatic designed to protect the sea's habitats and biodiversity. 
And that's because there are more than 7,000 species of animals and plants identified as native to the Adriatic. Most of them are endemic and a lot are rare and threatened. That's a lot. Some of these include bottlenose dolphins, sea turtles, manta rays, lots of whales, and some sharks. So I'm guessing you're not going to go swimming there, Rosanna, because of the whales. I mean, I'll go up to my knees. (laughs) That's it. Interesting fact. I'm dying to go to Croatia, and I have been forever because it is beautiful. There are all these really nice coastal towns. and Some are very cheap to stay in. A real interesting fact about the Adriatic Sea, besides me wanting to go to Croatia, is that it has over 1,300 islands. Whoa. 1,246 of them being Croatia's islands. Oh my gosh. 47 of them are permanently inhabited. That's a ton of islands for one country. It is. There are two that are just over 150 square miles. Huge. Wow. The best known islands are the 117 islands on which the city of Venice is built. Oh. I did not know it was that many islands that made up Venice. That's a lot. Round four. Rosanna, what's the next degree between Adriatic Sea and Great White Shark? I'm not sure how I could guess anything except shark because you said shark. (laughs) I did say shark. We're too far away from great white shark, but also you said shark, so... I did. I mean, maybe I'm doing the shark within a shark within a shark. It's it's the Russian nesting dolls of degrees. <laughs> I'm going to go with... <laughs> let's see. If the great white shark is the biggest shark, then I guess we're starting with the smallest shark. So my guess is shark, comma, mini. <laughs> <laughs> Mini shark. Yeah. <laughs> then there's only one way to go. I don't know how small the smallest shark is, but it sounds adorable. <laughs> Your guess of mini shark <laughs> is unfortunately incorrect, oh, darn. even though it's adorable. The next degree is habitat. Sure it is. Habitat is the type of natural environment where a particular species of organism lives. It's characterized by both physical and biological features. Habitat isn't necessarily a geographical area. It can be a rotten log, a host body for a parasitic organism, a clump of moss. There are really all kinds of things it could be. There are several types of habitats. Terrestrial vegetation type could be forest, steppe, grassland, desert. Freshwater habitats could be marsh, stream, river, lake pond, estuary. Marine habitats, uh, or salt water, include salt marshes, the coast, pretty big one, (laughs) reefs, bays, the open sea, the seabed, deep water, and my favorite, submarine vents. Interesting fact about those vents, they're hydrothermal. They were first discovered in the ocean in 1977, which seems pretty recent for that kind of discovery. Yeah, it does. And they happen when the seawater gets really heated After seeping through cracks where hot magma is close to the seabed. Mm. So you get these underwater hot springs and they can be up to... How hot do you think they could be? Underwater, huh? Um, In the bottom of the ocean where it's super cold usually. Right. Uh, 200 degrees? 640 (gasps) degrees Fahrenheit. That's very warm. Yeah. (laughs) They can get even hotter than that too. I mean, that's amazing you can get that hot in an area that's so cold. It's that magma. But because they get so hot and they're very unique, they support these communities of organisms and their immediate vicinity that you you can't find anywhere else in the world. There are about 350 different species of organism, mostly mollusks, uh, worms, and crustaceans, that they've discovered around hydrothermal vents. Just since they found the vents in 1977, Most of them completely new to science and unique to this habitat. Round five. Rosanna, what is the next degree between habitat and great white shark? Well, I mean, you talked a lot about the ocean there at the end of habitat. So, and you specifically even said open sea. I did. It's a terrifying place. 
don't even get me started. <laughs> so, but you also said parasitic organism or parasites, which I feel like, aren't there animals in the ocean that have like these sort of parasitic relationships? Hangers on. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And I don't know if sharks have those or not, but that's also a an option. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, are there just too many possibilities? It seems like there are, because you also said salt water. I think I'm probably going to go with salt water as my guess. Okay. Yeah. Your guess of salt water is incorrect the next degree is a reef what okay a reef is a bar of rock sand coral or similar material lying beneath the surface of the water a lot of reefs result from abiotic processes which is where sand gets deposited wave erosion planes down rock outcrops other natural processes best known reefs are coral reefs of tropical waters that we have learned about before. Mm -hmm. Some of the different kinds of biotic reefs. A fringing reef. That's where it's a reef attached to an island. Oh. A barrier reef forms a calcareous barrier around an island, which makes a lagoon between the shore and the reef. Ah. And an atoll is a ring reef with no land present. It's just out there by itself. There are also artificial reefs like shipwrecks, which I think are really cool. Yeah. And sometimes these enhance the physical complexity of featureless sand bottoms, which is a fancy way to say that they put something cool in a boring place. Also, they attract a whole bunch of really diverse bunch of organisms like algae and fish. Interesting fact. Earth's largest and most famous reef is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, Mm -hmm. and that is 1,400 miles long. Whoa. Yep. Huge. I mean, I knew that that was there and that was big, but that's really big. It's also not doing very well because of bad things we're doing to the oceans. Round six. Last chance, Rosanna. What's the next degree between reefs and great white shark? (sighs) Um... What I'd like it to be is shipwreck, (laughs) (laughs) but I think it's probably something more like the Great Barrier Reef or Australia, so I'm going to guess Australia. Your guess of Australia is incorrect, though there are a lot of great white sharks in Australia. In Australia? Around (laughs) Australia, I should say, (laughs) not in Australia. (laughs) The next degree is fish. (sighs) Nikki, fish. There's an article called Fish. There is. What is it? Just like 18 pages long? (laughs) It felt that way. Good lord. Fish? Seriously. There's one giant section of just the phylums. Oh my gosh. Please don't read that part to me. (laughs) (laughs) Fish. If you don't. No, listeners, then I think you may need a more remedial podcast (laughs) than this one. There's no such thing. (laughs) (laughs) But I will tell you, a fish is a gill-bearing aquatic craniate, which means they have a skull of bone or cartilage. Oh, me too. They're animals that lack limbs with digits, so no fingers. Oh my god, I just had a picture of a fish with fingers in my head. That... Don't. That's creepy. It was uncomfortable. I'm not okay with that. Yeah. I don't I don't like that at all. I'm going to take a pass on the hands, fish. <laughs> Included in the definition of fish are hagfish, lampreys, cartilaginous fish, and bony fish. Let me tell you a little about fish evolution. The earliest organisms that can actually be classified as fish showed up during the Cambrian period 541 million years ago. So they kept evolving through the Paleozoic era, and this is when they really diversified into lots of different forms. And some of them developed external armor that protected them from predators at that point. 
Okay, now I'm thinking of a fish dressed like a knight. I like it. Well, they weren't scary yet at that point. They didn't get kind of scary until the Silurian period, about 440 million years ago. That's when the first fish with jaws appeared. Like sharks. And some of them became marine predators rather than just the prey of other arthropods. Mm -hmm. Most fish now are ectothermic, which means cold-blooded. And their body temperatures really change depending on the ambient temperature. But there are some really large active swimmers, like the great white shark, and tuna also, that can hold a higher core temperature. Interesting fact about fish. There are over 33,600 different species. Wow. And there's they have a greater species diversity than any other group of vertebrates on Earth. That is a lot. The largest fish is the whale shark at about 52 feet. Oh, that's really big. And that's a fish, not a whale. Still really big. It's big as a whale. Yep. The smallest fish is 0.3 inches, and it's called stout infant fish. Infant fish. (laughs) It's adorable. Like a mini shark bet. (laughs) It really is, yeah. It's the very middle of your... Russian nesting fish. Ah, yes. Russian nesting fish. (laughs) I want some Russian nesting fish. They sound so cute. Let's talk about the great white shark, shall we? Let's. It is a species of large mackerel shark that can be found in the coastal surface waters of all the major oceans. It is everywhere. It's notable for its size, and the females are actually larger than the males. Females can get up to 20 feet in length. And 4,200 pounds. Couple tons. Males are usually closer to 11 to 13 feet. And 1,500 to 2,400 pounds. They used to think that they died pretty young, around 30. But now it looks like they can live as long as 70 years. Wow. However, they haven't found a specimen of female great white shark that was older than 40. Ah. Uh. They also wait a long time to have little babies. Male great white sharks take 26 years to reach sexual maturity. Females take 33 years to be ready to produce offspring. Is that like the longest of any kind of animal to be able to reproduce? I don't know. It's it's a really long time. Yeah, I mean, that's significantly longer than people. Yeah, it is. Great white sharks can swim as fast as 35 miles an hour. Oh, that's... Mm-mm. They can also go as deep as 3,900 feet, or at least they've been recorded wow. going that deep. They usually live in water temperatures between about 54 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So, sounds like it'd be a little safer in the Adriatic since it's warm there in the summer, but no guarantees. I mean, don't go in past your knees and you're good. <laughs> They also often travel in clans of two to six individuals with a social hierarchy that's similar to a wolf pack. Huh, interesting. I didn't know that. And the females, being larger, dominate the males. Of course. Interesting fact about great white sharks. Unsurprisingly, they're responsible for more recorded human bite incidents than any other shark. Well, you can't just put food out there and expect them not to eat it. (laughs) But... Humans are not the preferred prey of great white sharks. Well, probably because we're all fatty and gross. That's not it. It's the opposite, actually. We're too bony. They like fatty things like Uh, seals. Like seals, right. They're also responsible for the largest number of fatal unprovoked shark attacks on humans. Mm. The great white shark has been called the white death. (laughs) Wow. That's kind of mean, though. I mean... I think that's undeserved. Probably. But you know what, though? If a shark comes into your house and eats you, you could be mad at the shark. But if you go to the shark's house, (laughs) whose fault is it? Well, the thing is, too, great white sharks are very curious. And with humans, as well as a lot of other things in the ocean, including, like, buoys, they take a test bite to see if you're something they want to eat. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's why most people die. They don't get eaten by great white sharks. They get bitten and then they bleed out. Also, you can avoid great white sharks by swimming in the afternoon because they generally 
have attacks that occur in the morning within two hours of sunrise. They pretty much stop hunting after mid-morning. Here's what I thought was a very interesting story about great white sharks. They don't really have any natural threat, but they are scared of orcas. There was an incident in 1997 in the Farallon Islands off California. There was a female orca that immobilized a about 13-foot great white shark. It held it upside down to induce tonic immobility and kept it still kept it still for 15 minutes until it suffocated. Oh my gosh. The orca then ate its liver, <gasps> and it's believed that the scent of the dead shark's carcass caused all the great whites in the area to flee. They smelled the great white's blood and were like, I'm out of here. What? Even though there was a really great seasonal feed there at the time, they just left. There was a great white that had a satellite tag. It dove to 1,600 feet down and swam to Hawaii. What? <laughs> Did not surface until it got there. Oh my gosh. What would cause an orca to do that? To, I mean, that sounds like sadistic. Orcas are kind of sadistic. Are they? From what I've seen about them, That's yeah. That's very, like, human behavior of them, right? They're, they're kind of scary. So great. Now I'm afraid of whales <laughs> and sharks <laughs> and killer and whales <laughs> that aren't actually even whales. They're dolphins. So now I'm scared of dolphins. So thanks, mm -hmm. Nikki. Appreciate that. So we've made it through all six degrees. We went from Library of Alexandria to Alexander the Great, to Adriatic Sea, to Habitat, to Reef, to Fish, to Great White Shark. Rosanna, what did you think of the spiral? Well, in the beginning, I didn't think that those <laughs> two things could ever connect. But, you know, now mm -hmm. that you spell them all out that way, it makes total sense. That's the interesting thing about this show, I think. I, It's just so strange. Everything seems so disparate. But when you say it all in a row, it makes total sense. I thought it was interesting that you said that the great white shark is responsible for the largest number of unprovoked human attacks, which made me think, are there a lot of humans provoking <laughs> shark attacks? Is that a thing? That's is what I thought too when I read sport? it. Also, thank you for giving me those extra ocean fears to add to uh, mm -hmm. the ones I already had. You're welcome. It's time for Cheek of the Week. Our Cheek this week is an announcement. Announcement! Fanfare sounds. Oh, we don't have any fanfare sounds. Da -da -da -da. Perfect. That's my fanfare <laughs> sound. <laughs> You're welcome. So, we are about a month away from celebrating the Six Degrees of Wiki one-year anniversary. Yay! Yay! So, Nikki and I have been discussing some format changes. We're going to mix things up a little bit. We're also going to go to two episodes a month starting in November, except for the months that have five weeks. Those months, we are going to continue to have a guest episode during those months. So we're really excited to have a bunch of new people on the show to help us do the guessing. But the episodes will be longer, so you'll get some extra facts. Also, as we start season two, we have decided to start a Patreon account. In exchange for supporting the show with a few bucks, you get some really cool extra stuff every month. We're going to have early access to the show. We're going to have special blooper episodes because, you know, we cut a lot of stuff from this. Lots of really bad jokes. Singing. Just ridiculous, ridiculous things. <laughs> We're going to have discounts on merch. We'll have stickers you can get. All kinds of really cool stuff for lots of different tiers. And so that will be launching in November. You can go to Patreon and help support the show and get extra content. And if there's anything you'd love to see as a special perk for our Patreon, please let us know. And again, thank you so much for being listeners for this past year with us. That's our episode. Tune in next time for another Six Degrees of Wiki. You can keep up with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Six Degrees of Wiki. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can support the show by leaving a review, buying Six Degrees of Wiki merch like t-shirts, mugs, and bags, or even by donating directly to the show at SixDegreesOfWiki.com. 
Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.